here to sort of supplement um, some of the pieces of the index that Martin has just described to you and to encourage you to take a look at it. It's um, the links to the index and to the reports are all in your syllabus. And so you can situate or look up your own country, your region, and get a sense as you're thinking about solutions to this um, part of the security challenges in your country, what might make sense. Um, Martin went over this definition of organized crime. You'll have these slides just so that you have that. Um, next slide. All right, here you see um, the, the different elements of the index that Martin went over. So I'm just going to have these up for you to take a look at while I'm talking you through um, some supplementary elements here. And I'm really here to talk to you about coordination, multi-sectoral, multi-country, national to local level coordination mechanisms. Um, those cut across a lot of different criminal markets, many of the different criminal actors that you would need to engage in order to counter crime, and it cuts across the 12 different resilience factors. We're already hearing in the discussion groups as people are talking about countering terrorism, preventing violent extremism, now also in the domain of organized crime, multi-sectoral coordination, cross-border coordination, um, the, the fact that we can't have only militarized solutions to these problems, we need to be inclusive in our policy making so that we're actually getting at all angles of these complex and asymmetric security challenges. These are all lessons from the field of transnational organized crime as well. And so that's why I'll speak to you a bit about the security development and governance nexus, which I think you all know well how this fits into the problematics of organized crime, but it's because the fundamental drivers, the fundamental factors that exacerbate organized crime when it has already taken root in a society, these factors cut across not only the security sector, but also governance, um, and so the sectors that deal with governance and service provision, and the sectors that deal with development. Um, and so because there's this security development governance nexus that defines the problematics you all as the thought leaders will be dealing with in your countries. We have to think about coordination as a key piece that brings together many different kinds of the resilience factors you see tracked on the ENACT index. And that kind of coordination allows different state and societal officials and actors who are looking at different parts of this problem set to pool information and approaches for dealing with all of these different types, the five different criminal actors. Uh, the 15 different criminal markets, and as Martin mentioned, lots of organized criminal networks, these loose networks of individuals who do recruit locally, but the kingpins, as you said, are often very privileged people, um, sometimes associated with people who are high-level officials embedded in government, sometimes in the private sector. Um, you know, these networks um, are essentially um, very critical to deal with across these different kinds of criminal markets because they strategically move between those markets and between different geographies to evade any attempts that your governments and states might take to counter them. So that's why we're arguing here today. I'll speak a little bit about coordination. And then I'll talk about just for a few minutes, um, because I know I don't have many before we want to hear your questions and reactions. We'll also talk about a few examples of coordination that bring to life and bring together how you might apply some of what Martin's team measures on the index for building resilience. What would some interesting initiatives that um, require coordination to build resilience look like? Martin has already alluded to several different regional partnerships that give us some examples of what people are doing and what could be built upon that is already there on the level of the regional economic communities, but there are also initiatives within specific countries and on the really local level. There are some notable examples from y'all's countries that we can talk about. So just to be very brief on the security development governance nexus, it seems like many of you are already very well versed in how organized crime as a security challenge does relate to development and to governance, but if we look at alternative livelihoods, um, how does organized crime take root when kingpins have already taken advantage of an opportunity to try to set up their market in particular places? Well, um, if there are no alternative livelihoods for people in particular places to make a legal living and to make an honest living and a sustainable living, 
this makes uh, a place or a country uh, less resilient to the potential uh, uh, kingpin's attempts to take advantage of these opportunities. So livelihoods and economic livelihood is certainly a factor that can exacerbate or play into how organized crime takes root or continues to take root, um, even if that's not the cause of criminality in the first place, as Martin was saying. It's about a lot more than poverty. But alternative livelihoods in situations where you already have criminal networks deeply rooted, working with state actors, colluding uh, to you know, uh, siphon away these resources um, in an illegal way, this is often one piece of the puzzle. And that's a very um, developmental and governance related question and factor, not just human security, but also these other things. A state legitimacy also matters. It's sort of the, uh, the other side of the same coin. Most African states are not the sole provider of services to their population, and the extent to which state officials can bond with their citizens through the social contract that we talked about this morning, that affects what kinds of opportunities organized criminal groups even have to ingratiate themselves within communities or societies. When states can't offer a sustainable, reliable social contract, that doesn't cause organized crime, but that can make organized criminal actors who offer infrastructure, limited services, or even jobs to people in particularly communities, that can make those actors seem more legitimate or at least tolerable. And sometimes, when things are very deeply rooted, these actors can seem more legitimate than the state. That's certainly not always the case, but that's the high degree of risk um, on, on one end of the spectrum. And then finally, as Martin mentioned, corruption in government and high levels of government can facilitate organized crime and its perpetration. Um, if you look at how, um, for example, illegal logging works in, in many countries around the world, there are a lot of um, false documents, fake permits, commercial concessions that are required, um, declarations of different species of timber that are being moved across borders, um, and, and money laundering. And so there are different elements of these processes of making use of a country's natural resources where if there are opportunities for that kind of corruption to be enabled, certainly the top two types of criminal actors that we see on the index, certain very senior level officials who are embedded in the state and these disparate criminal networks who are shape shifting all the time, moving across geography and market, they often work together to take advantage of those loopholes. So that's a bit on the security development and governance nexus. The main question here then in relation to coordination is what role is there in that for security sector actors who are really interested in coming up with strategic solutions to counter transnational organized crime? And I have three pieces of advice for you on that. One, find ways to coordinate across borders, across agencies within your own country, and with citizens and community leaders. That's how we work across these three different levels that Dr. Mwibu cited this morning with um, countering terrorism. We work across the structural, the group, and the individual levels. We work down these different layers in order to address all angles of the problem. Um, and so um, if, we, if you look at the 12 resilience factors listed on the screen, the ones that Martin read off in the list and that you can read now for yourself, um, there are a variety of ways you could make use of these different elements of a, border, a baseline resilience response that works across those different levels and that brings state and societal actors who have different views of this at different levels into the picture. Um, coordination, um, I'm emphasizing this. If we could go to the third slide for a minute. We could go to the next one. Thank you. Coordination, just to give you basic definitions. Um, it is not the same as cooperation. It's sort of a proto-step towards formal cooperation, but it is an important process in policy making for strategic leaders. We're making different parts of a system and the component actors in that system and organizations involved work together more effectively, right? It can be a precursor to cooperating on strategic goals that might be in your country's national security strategy. Um, when done well, it generates a whole or an outcome that is way more than the sum of its parts. So more than what any one agency or branch of the armed services can do, coordination, though it's difficult, um, can help to generate um, you know, catalytic effects, um, exponential effects. And when done well, processes of coordination will help to delineate 
different entities' roles and responsibilities clearly. There may be overlaps, but we're clear on how those overlaps work and how we work as one unit um, to do something complex like counter transnational organized crime. So um, we know um, just from experience across Africa and elsewhere, dismantling organized criminal networks is a very, very difficult thing to do. It's a tall order. We can probably never do it fully or perfectly. But to do it well, you usually need joint actions by military, law enforcement, criminal justice officials, civil society, and others frequently, the fishery sector or the forestry sector or um, the forest guard, for example, are often involved in an effective response. So that requires a complex coordination process, careful design, careful and adaptive implementation, and a lot of planning across agencies and ministries to make all these entities work together effectively. It's really critical to do this because, as we said, the organized criminal networks are nimble. They're not states. They don't have professional ethics. They don't have the rule of law. They don't care where the border is. <laughs> um, you have to care where the border is because there are political borders and there's diplomacy that goes beyond what you're doing as a police officer or a military official or, or a justice official. So there's a lot of asymmetry in the, the, the type of um, nimbleness the organized criminal actors can have and that state officials working with civil society can have in their response. So coordination is key for reducing that asymmetry as much as we can. Um, I would also say, my second piece of advice, um, consider what Martin mentioned about the four quadrants of the ENACT index. I really encourage you to go into the ENACT report, find out which category your country is in. Is your country high criminality but also high resilience? Nigeria was on the list of top you know, five resilient countries. That might seem strange given how much we hear about organized crime in Nigeria. It's not if you look at the index and you realize Nigeria is a high criminality country, so you see a lot of things happening, but they have also developed a lot of mechanisms for dealing with that. Um, so um, are you a low criminality country um, with high levels of resilience? Your response to this, if you're that kind of country, your strategy for countering crime might be different. If you could go back one slide, you might choose different resilience factors to invest in depending on your profile on the index. If we could move back to that list of um, resilience factors on the previous slide, just so people can take a look while we're talking about this, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so you might invest in different sequencing or different combinations of those resilience factors, depending on whether you have high or low criminality in your country and whether you already have resilience mechanisms that need maintenance or you need to develop a whole range of other things that you may need to invest in. And then finally, use an adaptive approach. So we talked, Dr. Luca talked in the virtual sessions about problem-driven iterative adaptation, a PDIA approach. Consider what's already being done. Martin mentioned some of the things that are already being done on the regional level. Um, I'll mention one more thing there. The Central African Police Chiefs Coordination Organization it has a mixed brigades project. This is a great example of coordination within and across borders at the same time. All of the states in the CEMAC, the Central African Monetary Community, are working together to develop mixed brigades that include gendarme, customs officials, officials from the health sector. They've chosen together as a region 40 priority border areas and they will deploy these officials uh, together to have a multi-sectoral response to various forms of organized crime, all, probably all 15 of those criminal markets that you see pictured. Um, so that's an interesting um, thing to follow and to learn from. Maybe it wouldn't work in North Africa or East Africa, but there are ways to iterate and adapt. Um, there are also on the prosecutorial side for the judicial folks in the room, there are a wide variety of networks that already exist that one could leverage uh, the West African Network of Central Authorities and Prosecutors, the Great Lakes Judicial Cooperation Network. There's an Indian Ocean platform that facilitates cooperation on things like extradition, mutual legal assistance. I know um, Immaculate from Cameroon um, will probably know what I'm talking about. She's already uh, has our discussion group going into discussing some of these themes. Um, they matter a lot for cross-sectoral coordination. Um, on the national interagency level, 
Um, there are also some really interesting examples. I'm sure everyone has one to share. There are two that I have come across in my work at the Africa Center that I think are interesting for this room. In Tunisia, a couple of years ago, they established a secretariat for the sea that has ministerial representatives from a variety of sectors that are involved in maritime transnational organized crime issues. And they're working together to harmonize how capabilities are used in relation to the resources that are allocated in Tunisia across those agencies. So that's another catalytic way of trying to enhance coordination to pool resources and manage their implementation to deal with this complex problem in an effective way. In Republic of Congo, there's, this is a really interesting one for involving civil society. We have um, seen security, justice, financial, customs, and civil society actors work together to coordinate forestry audits. They have done audits of forestry concessions that the government has given out in Republic of Congo, and it, this is to address illegal logging, and it's part of the Ministry of Forests effort to try to coordinate responses to this form of transnational organized crime and to deal with repeat offenses in particular um, in relation to their uh, criminal code. Um, and so that's a great example of the Department of Forests or the ministry there actually saying, hey, we need the security sector involved, we need the justice sector involved, and we need the financial institutions involved. But we also need the customary and traditional leaders to be involved to make those audits of the concessions happen. Chinese concessions, European concessions, American concessions. So in terms of external actors' interests, um, all of them are addressed through this one tool that um, the Congolese have come up with. And then finally, because my time is um, up, but let me leave you with one local level coordination um, example. This is a nice way that national authorities have done something with very, very local um, entities in order to coordinate on countering transnational organized crime. Um, and this is uh, an example from Benin. And since 2011, Benin has had this agency for integrated management of border spaces. So an integrated border security agency. They have spearheaded multi-sectoral efforts to build public trust in the government and foster citizens' sense of belonging to the nation. And this is in a particularly, uh, a place that is particularly far from the Beninese capital. It's a place that, because of that geography, is very affected by terrorism and organized crime. And they have put, they have used, the agency has used a variety of measures to try to coordinate with local leaders on strategies that might work for dealing with these issues. This has included placing defense and security forces in border zones um, and having them patrol more often to combat crime, creating special units that work across borders with Benin's neighbors, to deal with organized crime, providing just civil law legal assistance, legal assistance on civil issues, not criminal issues, for members of border communities, things like getting your identity documents, getting a marriage certificate. These things make you like the state a little bit more if the service is provided. Uh, paying teacher salaries, making sure schools stay open or are built, and engaging youth in various ways. So these are some interesting ways across different levels that we see creative responses in development, and I would encourage you all to think about what works for your context and build on what we have. Thanks.